Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Cornwell, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Business Development here at Plunkett Cooney. It's my pleasure to serve as coordinator for today's program, which focuses on the recent federal COVID-19 vaccination requirements for large employers and CMS providers. Joining us today to explain these requirements are Plunkett Cooney Labor and Employment Law Practice Group members, Laura Dynan from our office in Petoskey, Michigan, and Claudia Orr from our office in Detroit. Before we get started, I'd like to take just a few moments to provide you with some background about our speakers today and our law firm. For those of you who don't know, uh, Plunkett Cooney is one of the largest and oldest law firms in Michigan, and one of the largest and oldest in, in the Midwest, for that matter, with about 140 attorneys. We have offices in seven Michigan cities, <clears throat> as well as in Chicago, Illinois, Indianapolis, Indiana, and Columbus, Ohio. Our employment law practice group includes more than 20 attorneys who focus in their practice in the areas of traditional labor law, human resources consulting, and investigations, as well as employment litigation. We uh, toggle over here to the next slide. Just a bit of background, <clears throat> excuse me, about our, our presenters today. Claudia Orr has over 30 years of experience representing employers ranging from Fortune 500 companies to small businesses and nonprofits. She provides advice on all aspects of employment law and defends her clients in litigation and administrative hearings. Claudia also regularly serves as an arbitrator and mediator in employment law cases. She's a member of Detroit Sherm's Board of Directors and also serves as a member of D. Sherm's Legal Affairs Committee. Laura Dynan has over 30 years of experience as well, advising employers on workplace-related issues. She's built a successful practice representing public and private sector employees on all, of all sizes throughout Northern Michigan. Laura's expertise includes traditional labor and all, uh, of the, all the different types of employment law matters that you run into uh, during the course of business. She's the current secretary and a past president of the board of directors of Northern Michigan, of the Mo Northern Michigan Society of Human Resource Directors. Just a couple of housekeeping notes and I promise I'll turn it over to our speakers. For the Q&A portion of our program, we're gonna use our questions uh, tool on your GoToWebinar navigation display. Just take a moment now, if you could, to locate that tool and feel free to enter questions as they occur to you during the program. At the end of the presentation, we're gonna to try to answer as many as possible. And I always add one caveat, uh, that being that we ask you to please ask questions of a general nature. Getting into too many specifics about your particular situation is probably best done in private, and I hope you would agree with that. Finally, I want to mention that today's session is being recorded, and that recording will be available on our event page on Plunkett Cooney's website, which is located at plunkettcooney.com. Feel free to share that link with your colleagues or even review it uh, yourself if it's helpful. Thanks again for being a part of our program today. Now let's get started. Claudia, I believe you are leading off today's presentation, so take it away. Thank you, John. Um, Participants today might recall that on September 4th, with much fanfare, President Biden announced how he intended to get America vaccinated. He intended to use a, a series of executive orders and agency rules, and many of them are not very controversial as far as whether or not he has the authority, but, but some are. I mean, certainly he controls the military and federal employees, federal contractors, the Head Start programs and the CMS regulated entities, that's the uh, Medicare and Medicaid, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Um, but there are others that are a little bit more controversial, including the larger private employers. Um, he also announced that those who work on military bases and on Indian lands, tribal lands, will also be required to get, to get their vaccinations. Today, we're gonna to focus on OSHA's larger employer mandate and its current status, and also the CMS rules that, that apply to companies that receive Medicare and Medicaid funds and are regulated by CMS. Then we'll discuss some implementation suggestions, um, the exemptions that you've heard about, medical and religious exemptions, and some other issues related to COVID in the workplace. So Laura, you're up first with the OSHA larger mandate. Thanks, Claudia. So I think everybody on this line probably knows that OSHA issued a large employer mandate in the form of an emergency temporary standard on November 4th. 
and it gets published in the federal registry and takes effect 30 days after that. So the you're supposed to have a um, it first of all it applies to private employers with 100 employees or more, and you count those. Um, everyone that's employed by your company, you count remote workers, you count, um, you don't count temps. I think, um, sorry, I'm out of order here, but you, you don't count temporary employees. They would be counted by the temporary agency, but you count everyone who works for you, whether they come into one location or they're spread across the 50 states to see if you, you are um, a hundred employer, employee, or more employer. And the federal rule does not apply to public employers, but MIOSHA has to adopt a plan in 30 days from when OSHA issued this. So we should be seeing MIOSHA's plan any day now because they'll have to have that out um, by December 4th. And MIOSHA is required to have their plan apply to public employers. So while OSHA's plan doesn't, my OSHA's plan will. So it essentially is going to affect private and public employers. Um, but the private employers, it's 100 employees or more. We don't know what my OSHA will do, but it, um, they have to be at least as restrictive as the OSHA plan, and they can be more restrictive if they want to. Um, so we have to wait to see what's going to happen with my OSHA, but it'll be similar to OSHA. So what do you have to do? Large employers, 100 or more, have to comply by December 4th and come up with their plan of what they're going to do by January 4th. There are a few exceptions um, that apply but basically, employers are going to have to um, come up with their plan. They're going to have to require vaccines or testing for anyone who comes into the workplace. If you have employees who go to a workplace place, but they're the only person in that workplace, you as a large employer have to have a plan, but that employee doesn't have to um, wouldn't fall under the must get vaccinated or testing. The same with employees who strictly work remotely from home that never come into work. They would not have to be vaccinated or um, do the weekly test reporting. But if you have remote workers who occasionally come into work, they fall under it. So anytime they're coming into work, they either have to have already proved to you that they're vaccinated or they have to bring a test that's been done within the last seven days that's negative. If you have employees that work exclusively outside, um, you know, we're kind of going into the winter season, so not sure that there'll be that many employees currently that will fall under this, but for instance, um, landscapers, people that never go into a physical building for their work, they would fall outside this mandate. But again, you would count those employees to determine if you are a large employer. You still um, have to offer exemptions if people meet medical or re religious accommodation requirements. So you have to be mindful of that in your plan. Uh, next slide. Thanks, John. So the larger employer mandate does not have an option for just testing. Some of you may be familiar if you have any federal con contracts or have followed the um, earlier rules. There were, um, I don't want to call it, I guess I call it an opt-out for um, allowing just testing. And this is confusing, I'm sorry. You can't have a plan that allows for just testing. You're supposed to require the vaccinations if people can't get them for um, the medical or religious accommodation reasons, 
then they can do just testing. But you can't have a plan that says everybody can stay unvaccinated and just bring me tests. Sorry for any confusion I caused by that. Um, if you are granting them any exemptions to any employees, they have to submit proof of testing every seven days and wear masks at all times. You still have to have your requirements for, um, you know, cleaning, sanitizing any surfaces that they touch. You probably, um, if you have a fair amount of unvaccinated people in your workplace um, that meet the exemption requirements, you may want to put mask requirements in for everyone else. You don't have to, but um, they're still very mindful of the spread, especially with the Delta variant. So if somebody meets a medical or religious accommodation exemption, the um, you have to require every seven days, they have to bring you those test results. And you can and should require, you have to require employees who tell you they're vaccinated, you need a copy of their vaccination card, basically. And you put it in your medical file and you um, track who's not vaccinated. You're supposed to encourage people to get vaccinated if they're not. Um, the goal is to, get everyone vaccinated and there are going to be people that can't but the people that are holdouts um, and don't meet an exemption can't be in the workplace you're going to have to figure out how to either keep them home or um, they can be terminated uh, next slide thanks um, so technically december 4th is the magic date for having a plan January 4th is the magic date for implementing the plan. As of that date, everybody who's unvaccinated is going to need to come in with a valid test within the last seven days. But there have been um, lawsuits filed in every single federal circuit court across the country. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit stayed, um, issued an injunction and stayed implementation of the rule they um, reviewed it and reiterated that stay, refused to move it, remove it. And it went to, um, I think Claudia is going to touch on this, but it went to, um, there's a multi-district panel that um, deals with the situation when there's the same issue pending in, in multiple circuits. And it got picked to go into the, um, they randomly pick one circuit to handle all the cases, and they randomly pick the Sixth Circuit, which is our circuit court. So it'll be heard in um, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, all the cases pending across the country, so more to come on that. While the lawsuits are um, in the courts, this for now, the injun injunction is in place. The Sixth Circuit could lift it, but um, they probably won't. We suggest that you get your plan in place, and I think that there will be further guidance before the January 4th implementation date, but you're going to need to be ready to go January 4th if we don't get that guidance or if it affirms that OSHA has the ability to implement the ETS as it is currently um, pending. Let's see the next slide, John. Thanks. So this is what I was just talking about. The U.S. Judicial Panel on Multi-District Litigation assigned it to the Sixth Circuit, which covers Michigan. Generally, the Sixth Circuit is very pro-employee these days, and so it's um, it's not a given, but they may very well strike this rule because it takes away the employee's right to decide if they want to be vaccinated. Whatever they decide is almost 100% sure to go up to the Supreme Court. Um, it, it's just such a hot button issue that it's likely it'll end up there. And they, it's very unlikely that 
all of this is going to be decided before January 4th, but I do think that there will be further guidance before January 4th, so keep tuned to that, and we will obviously update you as soon as we get any information that could be helpful to you. And now Claudia is going to talk about um, the CMS interim final rule, which is slightly different than the OSHA ETS. So Claudia, your turn. Okay, thank you, Laura. So um, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services doesn't regulate all the providers of healthcare services that are paid for by, by Medicare or, or Medicaid. And so the interim final rule only applies to those that are actually regulated by CMS. And those include, and I've listed them there, but ambulatory, surgical centers, hospitals, programs of all-inclusive care. Um, some of my uh, area agencies on aging have the PACE programs. Um, hospitals, and that includes all kinds of hospitals. Long-term care facilities, which include skilled and nursing homes. Home health care agencies, those that send workers out to individuals' homes, public health agencies, community mental health centers, et cetera. And so some of my nonprofit agencies or some of my clients that receive Medicare or Medicaid payments, um, they're technically not covered under the CMS interim final rule. But the way the rule was written, it's, it's exceptionally broad in, in that the way it defines staff. And so staff is broadly defined to include not just their employees or licensed practitioners, but students that come onto their property, trainees, the volunteers who work like in the gift shop at the hospital, um, others who provide care, treatment, or other services for the entities. So for example, I have area agencies on aging that send workers into hospitals to help patients transition back home. Um, and so even though they don't work for the hospital, they go into the hospital and they provide services to the patients under an arrangement so they're covered. And it involves um, workers regardless of whether they actually have clinical responsibility or patient contact. So even if your entity is not covered, some of your employees may be. And if so, then comes the question for you, uh, this is more of a practical problem, um, if you've got two-thirds of your workforce being required out of fairness, do you require all of them? What if the only part of your workforce that's not covered, that doesn't go into the hospitals, even though your entity itself isn't covered, is your administrative staff, your, your higher echelon? Do you allow them not to be covered? What kind of sig you know, signal does that send to your workers? So that's more of a practical problem you have to consider. Next slide. So now there's some limited exceptions to the rule for these for employees. And those include those who exclusively provide telehealth and telemedicine services or support services. But even the exceptions have exceptions. So <laughs> um, I, I guess what's given is now being taken away. Um, but if the work is performed exclusively outside of the setting where the services are provided to the patients, then the individual and the individual doesn't have any contact with patients, their families or caregivers. Um, so, you know, there's an exception to the exceptions. Um, so for example, let's say you have a back office that's located, uh, previous slide please. Um, thank you. There you go. Um, so if, for example, you have a back office that's located within the walls of a hospital, those workers may actually not be required to to get um, um, vaccinated because they you know they're not involved in in um, patient services, but they may have contact with the patients as they walk around the hospital, as they go to the lunch room, and as they you know as the the social worker goes upstairs to communicate with the families or. So if they have any contact, possible contact with either the patients or their families, even if they're not providing patient care, then those employees would not be excluded from the mandate. They're gonna to have to get vaccinated. Next slide. So um, what does the rule require? Um, first, the employer must assure that all workers have received at a minimum their first dose prior to providing care. 
So many of the agencies that receive um, Medicare and Medicaid um, payments, they're already behind the eight ball because they've got people still going out in the field who haven't actually had their first dose yet. Um, remember, there's, there's just like the large employer mandate, there's no opt out for just testing. Um, but there are ex exemptions, just like with the larger employer. You can have a medical or a religious accommodation um, exemption. We're going to cover those in more detail in a couple of slides. Um, but if the exemptions are granted, uh, you have to provide the weekly testing. And that every seven days, they have to come in with proof of a negative test every seven days. And so this is going to require a lot of paperwork, especially if you have a large number of employees who are exempt. Um, and so the question becomes, what kind of test? Um, the rapid test, just to so understand the difference, the rapid test is not a very sensitive test. And so if the person was exposed a couple days ago and they go in for a rapid test, you know, where they shove the, you know, it up the nose and so on, and they, they get the results back fairly quickly. Those aren't sensitive. There may not be enough virus lurking about in the body for that test to actually come back as positive. But the PCR test at that point may actually be able to detect the virus and would come back with a positive result. So the, the problem with the rapid test is that they're just not very sensitive and they provide too many negative, um, negative, false negatives. And so you should really be requiring the PCR test. And there's a lot of places that will pr provide you a same day result on the PCR test. This isn't like a year ago where you had to wait to get, get tested somewhere. Uh, I know the Beaumont centers provide testing and you can get your results back on the PCR test. Um, within, uh, it could even be hours at this point, but back in April it was within a day. So um, make sure that your employees are getting the PCR test. It's the only way to really protect everybody. Okay, next slide. So as I was saying, um, not all providers of services are paid by Medi that are paid by Medicare and Medicaid services are covered by the rule, just those that CMS actually regulates. So the rule doesn't apply to such healthcare entities as you know, smaller physician offices or the staff that work in small healthcare facilities. But keep in mind that the state regulates and issues licenses, licenses for these facilities. And so you're gonna find that the state may jump in and start developing its own rules um, very similar to CMS, it, unlike my OSHA that has to mimic or do better than OSHA, uh, that doesn't mean that our state has to when it comes to um, the other healthcare entities. So we may or may not get some more rules provided by the state for the other entities. Next slide. So here are some high level considerations and suggestions for implementing the mandate. And of course, you need to see what works for your workforce. So for example, do you know how which employees or how many have been vaccinated? You really should be gathering copies, not you know, of not just having people say yes or no, but you actually need the copies of the vaccination cards or the medical records showing that the employee got vaccinated. Start doing that now because um I just had one client tell me that they just determined that 45% of their workplace is, is not vaccinated. They thought maybe they had maybe 10% of people were saying no to vaccination. And they were stunned to find out that about 45% say no. So that's a huge issue for that employer. Um, get statements from those employees who do not intend to get vaccinated. So you're not just waiting until last minute. I know some of my um, Head Start um, clients you know, they've got to be fully vaccinated by the time the, the term, the winter term starts on January 4th. And so they can't wait until last minute because they're going to have everybody out over the um, holidays and they're not going to be able to get people, you know, in line and hired and replaced and so on um, to cover those who determine that they're not going to get a vaccination. 
you can't wait until last minute and then have your employees go on Christmas break and then have them come back on September on uh, January 4th and find out that you've got half your workforce that can't continue to work there. Um, so get you know get statements from employees to find out whether they get vaccinated or not and have them sign something that says they understand that if they don't report by a certain date with their proof of vaccination it will be considered job abandonment and a voluntary resignation and this will help you out with um, your unemployment issues okay next slide uh, for medical and religious exemptions, um, they can be denied if they create an undue hardship, but be, there's a difference between what is an undue hardship for the medical exemption and for the religious exemption. So the medical exemptions, like what you're used to analyzing under the ADA, and you know when you have to prove an undue hardship under the ADA, the bigger the employer, the more resources it has, the less likely you're going to meet that burden of proof that's necessary to prove an undue hardship. But the smaller you are, um, the less resources, financial resources you have, the, the more likely you may be able to prove it, but it's still a fairly high standard. For the religious exemptions, though, it's basically anything that causes you more than a mere inconvenience, um, a slight inconvenience. So, if you look at your scheduling issues, your staffing shortages, your uh, risks to others' um, health, all these can be things that you can say, I'm sorry, but this is gonna cause us more than a slight inconvenience and we're just gonna deny religious exemptions. Next slide. So for the medical exemption, what you really wanna do is get a note from the doctor on their letterhead from the practice and it shouldn't be, if you have doctors working for you, it should not be one of your own doctors that's signing this because now you could end up with a doctor, one of your own doctors having to be a witness against your your company. So, um, but you should have it on letterhead from that practice. And they've got to say the reason why it's contraindicated for that employee. Um, some exemptions actually could be temporary like pregnancy. So just keep that in mind. Next slide. For the religious exemptions, you can ask them, um, ask the employee, you know, to explain their firmly held religious or spiritual belief that they have. And if they've been asking, have you been vaccinated in the past? And if so, what has changed? Um, and then you can also have them attest to it and indicate that it's grounds for discharge. So you can have something on the bottom of the form that says, I understand, you know, I attest under penalties of perjury that the information above is true and accurate to the best of my knowledge. And I understand that if I provide false information, it would be grounds for discharge. Um, it could also be grounds for criminal penalties. Um, I actually have a form some employees will object because they know that the mRNA vaccinations came from a, an aborted fetal stem cell from back in the 1980s. And so, you know, that line has been replicated and replicated since the 1980s. And so I actually have a questionnaire that also asks the employee if that's their basis. And it lists like 30 other drugs and you ask them if they've taken these drugs and it includes such things because these all came from from that same fetal stem cell line uh, such things as aspirin and tylenol tums pepto-bismol um benadryl i mean there's there's like 30 or 40 different medications over the counter that that people are taking that came from that state same uh fetal stem cell line um, of course, you know, this isn't foolproof either because the employee could say, holy cow, I didn't know these things came from that. I won't take those anymore either. So, I mean, it's, it's not like it's, um, you know, etched in stone that they're going to say, yes, I take them. I didn't understand. And, you know, if I've been taking that, then I've got no problem with the, with the vaccination. I'm, I'm not finding that to happen. Uh, next slide. So as you consider whether to grant, to grant exemptions or not, just consider this. 
um, look at the employee and the job that they're performing, and can they work remotely? And I don't mean just can they do most of their job remotely, but can they do all of their job remotely? You don't want to start allowing employees to, you know, only do like 70% of their job because, you know, the other 30% would require them to come into the workplace um, and they're not going to be coming in. Um, look at how many employees have actually requ requested the exemptions. Um, it may just be that you can't grant all the religious exemptions because there's so many people that are asking for medical exemptions, which are hard to turn down, that you can't grant all the religious exemptions too. So you might just deny all religious exemptions because if you don't, you know, you got to look at staffing issues. How many people are going to be out of the workplace? Can you hire replacements? Um, and so you have to look at all the exemptions, your workforce, and how it's playing out in your workforce. And that's why you really need to get a jump on what's going on and you need to start doing this right away. The same is going to be true if you end up with a OSHA um, 100 employer mandate and it ends up being affirmed and, and it's, it's now in play. If you haven't done all your groundwork first and are ready to go, you're going to be behind the eight ball. But regardless of the, of the exemptions that you grant, make sure it's clear that any exemption that's granted is revocable at the company's discretion because things change in your workforce. And you may find out that what you thought you could agree to, there's still more exemptions coming in and you already granted, you know, 10% of your employees exemption requests. Now you got more still coming in. Oddly enough, some of them read exactly the same. They copied it off the same internet site. So just keep in mind that it should be your ability to revoke it at any time. And of course, if you're going to revoke it, it's got to be because you met that undue hardship exemption um, for exemptions. Um, again, medical are hard, harder to deny than the religious ones. Okay, Laura, you're up next again. Thanks, Claudia. So if you have unvaccinated employees who get an exemption um, that you've granted, you have to have a mask mandate in place all day, everywhere. You can require them to have their lunch or breaks off property if you want to have, you know, if, you, if they can't be isolated um, for those periods of time because you can require them to have a mask on at all times on your um, employer premises. You have to implement um, social distancing requirements that have already been out there that people probably are doing, but that has to be in place um, in your plan for unvaccinated employees on site. They have to continue to answer screening questions before coming on site every day or every time they come on site, um, you need to get the PCR test. And that is, uh, excuse me, that is part of the rule. That is the requirement that you can't accept rapid testing. You have to have the PCR negative test results every seven days. The employer is not um, responsible for paying for these tests. The employee has to schedule their own test, go get it, give it to the employer and they have to pay for the test. Um, if somebody tests positive, the testing requirement is waived for the next 90 days after they've recovered from COVID. That's COVID, that's the window. So um, testing um, results every seven days, unless they come back positive, sit out the quarantine period, when they return, there's a 90-day window from the positive test um, where the seven-day testing rule is suspended. Employees have to be removed from the workplace if they don't provide their test results on time. If you, um, next slide, please. If you have employees who refuse or fail to comply with your rules and the vaccine mandate, um, you can put them on unpaid administrative leave. They can be forced to comply before they're allowed to return to the workplace. 
You can put a time limitation on that. You can advise them that their failure to comply and return a, um, a deadline set by you will be considered job abandonment and that you'll consider it a voluntary resignation and they won't be eligible for unemployment. And the unemployment agencies have been upholding denial for um, people who have quit their jobs or lost their jobs because they failed to comply with vaccine and or um, COVID rules that have been put in place. So um, if you can let them know that, that they may, that, they will likely be denied for unemployment if they don't comply with these rules. Uh, next slide, please. Most of the mandates require full compliance by January 4th, which would be either vaccinated or bringing in a negative test within the, done within the last seven days on January 4th. Um, as Claudia said, CMS requires at least the first shot before seeing patients. Um, you have to take into consideration that if you have unvaccinated employees who are going to get vaccinated to comply with your rule, this the windows are out there. The um, three-week waiting period between Pfizer and I think Moderna is four weeks. So it doesn't give you a lot of time to get this out to your employees and get people fully vaccinated by January 4th. Um, and it's supposed to be two weeks past the last shot in the first um, the first round. So one Johnson and Johnson, or two Pfizer, or two Moderna, and then two weeks past that is considered full immunization. Right now, they're not requiring boosters, but as an aside, I heard this morning that they're thinking by next year um, it's going to be considered fully vaccination after three shots, not two. Um, so get your plans in place by December 4th because with the holidays, it's going to be hard for people to get out there and get this done if they don't have advance notice. And again, even if it doesn't go into play January 4th, you have to have your plan in place. So documentation, you need copies of the vaccine cards, you need copies of the negative test results and they get kept in the personnel, um, not in the personnel files, but in each individual medical record for those employees. Um, you know, you probably have medical files on some or all of your employees um, and you're going to need to create them um, if you don't for these records. You, if you have employees who um, have refused and requested an exemption, you have to have those records kept in writing. Again, copies of the testing records. You have to keep copies of the answers to the screening questions, and you have to track all COVID cases in your workplace. And um, it, it's a lot of tracking, but basically, um, I think one file per employee for all of these um, all of these records kept separate from the personnel file is probably the way that you're going to have to go. And I believe that um, you can keep electronic copies if you scan in what they give you. Um, and Claudia, you can you can weigh in on that. But I'm pretty sure electronic record keeping is okay, but you have to have an actual copy of it that you've scanned in. Yeah, and I agree. Find, yeah. Um, and then check the CDC website for the current quarantine and isolation requirements. If you have employees who are exposed or test positive or have symptoms, but I can tell you that I have, um, Claudia and I have been checking it on and off, and I went on it before our presentation started today and they are deferring to um, the OSHA site now. Uh, CDC says that they've archived their information, you can access it, but um, the it, it may not be up to date because they're following what OSHA tells you to do. And 
So currently, if you have a fully vaccinated person who gets um, exposed, they can be allowed into the workplace unless they're symptomatic, but it's recommended that they get tested three to five days after that exposure. And obviously, if they test positive, get them out of the workplace. And it's also recommended that they wear a mask for the 14 days after exposure or until they get a negative test result. If they're unvaccinated, they have to get tested um, two or more days after the exposure. They have to stay out of the workplace and um, until um, Sorry, I'm trying to find, it's very, okay, so for unvaccinated, you have to remove them from the workplace if they get exposed or have symptoms. You're supposed to get tested more than two days after the exposure, and if that test is negative, they still need, if it comes back positive, then they sit out um, 10 days, and if it's negative, they have to get retested five to seven days after the exposure because, again, sometimes it doesn't show up in the system. And if that test is negative, then they can come back seven days after that close contact if the second test comes back negative. If it comes back positive, then obviously they stay home till the symptoms are gone or 10 days past the um, contact, I believe. All right. I think there's, that's there's what... a, Yeah, there's a couple of things I was just going to touch upon before John opens it up to questions. Um, we were looking at how soon um, employers needed to get the show on the road with um, the series of vaccinations and the waiting periods in between and then two weeks after that to be, be considered fully vaccinated. I did read that that the government will consider the employer to be in full compliance as long as they've actually had all the shots needed by January 4th, even though the, the two weeks um, haven't passed since the last shot. Um, and then just one other thing about the polit about the firmly held, sincerely held beliefs. It can't just be a political belief. I can't, you can't say, well, you know, I believe this whole thing is, you know, the pandemic's a bunch of crap and vaccines don't work and no one require should be required and I've had it in the past and, you know, all that other kind of stuff. So, so I don't have to get the vaccination. Um, a firmly held political belief doesn't count. It's got to be a sincerely held um, religious, spiritual belief. And then finally, just a practical matter, um, you really want the medical records to be handled by human resources to the extent at all possible. What you don't want to do, you know, and again, it depends on your workforce and how you're set up, but Preferably, an immediate supervisor should never have access to a direct report to medical records. So if you want to have someone higher up at, at that facility collected because you'll have HR there or something, that's fine. But you really don't want your immediate supervisors to be gathering information on their direct reports. So preferably HR, but at least skip over a um, reporting line line of reports in the chain of command before someone else is um, and let that other person collect the, the medical information. Okay, John, do we have any questions? Keeping in mind that we don't really have a lot of guidance out there yet. <laughs> yeah, we'll do our best, right? <laughs> there is There are a couple, so let me run through them. Um, here's the first. How do you treat companies that are controlled ownerships when counting 100 employees? Um, and the example is given two separate entities in different states, the same ownership and shared resources at a corporate level. I believe oh, I, they are counted as one company. Is that your understanding, yeah, Claudia? Yeah, mine too. Um, so, I mean, it's, it, it, usually if you have um, 
um, wholly owned subsidiaries, normally you would be able to count wholly owned subsidiaries separately because they're legally separate entities. You know, and you have a shared um, ownership between them. Um, I, I think you got to count them all as one. Yeah, here it says the EPS applies to all employers that have a total of at least 100 employees across, excuse me, across all of their U.S. locations at any time the ETS is in effect. So if your workforce fluctuates and you hit 100 at any point, then you're covered at, at, on that date. And it says related entities may count as one entity if they handle safety matters as one company. So that's how you decide if each company has a separate safety policy or you know handles it differently they would be separate but if everybody has um one safety policy the safety you know director whatever then they're one company for purposes of the large employer rule yeah usually those are governed at the top as a, i mean they may have a separate safety committee but Usually there's one person in the corporate office that's in charge of safety. Right. Great, thank you. Uh, these questions kind of came in throughout the program. So this this one probably would be a good reminder. The question is simply, is the mandate currently halted and or suspended? Yeah, it's currently suspended, but it could be lifted any time. And as Claudia um, reiterated a couple times, get you, you can't, suddenly on January 4th comply because you have, you can't, your employees may not know this is coming or that it applies to them or that, you know, you seriously are going to have a policy and they need notice that um, they better get their act together and either get vaccinated or figure out why they um, would be entitled to an exemption. So it's not going to be enforced right now well there's um an injunction in place but when it goes into effect it could be enforced at any time and one of the things you know obviously osha cannot be out there knocking on the door of every company but they will enforce like they do most of their rules based on employee complaints so if you have if you're a company that decides to risk it by not putting this in place or not taking it seriously, you run the risk that you've got vaccinated employees or vulnerable employees that are worried about your workplace and their health and safety. And if they call OSHA and complain or my OSHA and complain, that's how enforcement will happen. And we all know that that happens more often than not. Great, thank you. A couple more questions in the queue. So this is our last call for questions. If you'd like to type one into the question queue, please do that now. Um, the next question is, must home office-based salespeople be included? Must they be tested weekly and or fully vaccinated if they travel to customer locations frequently? Depends on if the location they have to travel to is going to require it. I know um, one of my agencies, nonprofits that's governed by CMS, um, sent, sent an email to me saying that as a um, supplier of services to that agency, I needed to report on my vaccination status and be fully vaccinated um, and in compliance and, and produce my vaccination card before I ever set foot in their facility again. Um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna provide that, but I, I typically don't end up in my clients' offices that often, um, especially since the pandemic's been there, but that gives you an idea. So a lot of companies, I know there's a lot of engineering firms that send their employees, project managers out to like Ford or GM or one of the, or another company, they've got to have their employees vaccinated even even if that company wasn't man mandated itself it can require anything it wants of people i mean just because um you know your company isn't isn't subject to a mandate that doesn't mean that your company can't require its entire workforce to get vaccinated 
or to have everybody who steps foot on your property vaccinated. So mandates are just, you know, government mandate, but companies can have their own mandates for anybody that's coming into their buildings. Great. This next person is a little confused. It was again during the heart of the presentation, so hopefully things were clarified, but I'll just read through it and then maybe could hit some of the high points again. Um, this person says, I'm confused. I thought that we could one, accept vaccination records, two, allow for weekly testing, and three, accept exemption requests and allow for weekly testing. Well, exemption requests are something that if they qualify, you could grant everybody an exemption request if you wanted to, if provided they fit the criteria. I mean, not your entire workforce is going to fit the criteria um, unless they Xerox off the same religious, sincerely held belief, and they all sign it one at a time. Um, but as a practical matter, um, you can grant every single exemption request that you get if it meets the bare minimum and require testing. Some of my clients are actually having um, federally qualified health clinics come onto their property and do the testing for them and they're paying for it. Um, that's gonna be expensive, very expensive per employee that has to get tested every seven days. And so if you're paying for the testing, um, the more employees you grant the exemption to, the more your, your testing costs are going to be. Um, and employees may not want to cover a test if their carrier, their insurance carrier is not covering it every seven days. So, you know, if, if everybody in your workforce happens to qualify for an exemption and you want to grant them and it works for you and they all comply with the testing, the masking the entire time they're in the workplace, um, social distancing and, and answering the screening questions, then have at it. That's, that's going to be an awful lot of work, though, to, to manage um, a large workforce all getting tested. But they can't, you can't just grant it if they don't, if they don't um, actually qualify for the exemption. Okay, the next question is, how do we deny religious exemptions under the ADA? Well, the ADA doesn't have anything to do with religious exemptions. That would come under Title VII. And Title VII has always said that anything more than a de minimis um, hardship is something that you don't have to grant. So, for example, um, you know, if it, 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 usually the, the cases came up because somebody needed every Sunday off or every Saturday night off or something like that. Usually they were scheduling issues or a religious holiday. Um, and the courts have said that, you know, you can grant it, but you can tell them you can have it off if you find your own replacement. And then you should be supportive of the idea that they find a replacement. Um, but if they don't get a replacement, you didn't have to grant it because it would cause you a scheduling inconvenience. So, you know, the ADA has applies for the medical. Um, it does not apply to the religious exemption. And that's always been easy to deny. Right. The ADA is going to be much harder to deny, but religious you can. Okay, so the next question is, I read that rapid testing was acceptable. I was also advised as an employer to pay for the testing as it is currently in direct conflict with the DOL and ADA to require employees to pay. Yeah, I don't know of any requirement for the employer to pay under OSHA's mandate um, or I under the CMS under, rules. I think it may be required under the OSHA ETS for healthcare. It's it yeah. specifically is not required under the new ETS. But if you're a healthcare employer under the OSHA ETS for healthcare, I think you might be right. You have to pay for the testing. Yeah, there's a lot of different rules in the medical field under the um, yeah it, it, for. It's very different. Yeah. Okay. Including so taking time question. off if you tested positive. Right. 
Okay, so our next question is, do temporary agencies need to submit weekly test re testing results for unvaccinated temps that work on site for us? Yes. That was short, good. <laughs> is weekly testing, <laughs> I love that one. Uh, is weekly testing and masks the only accommodations for people that have religious or medical exemptions? Well, you can give them remote work to keep them out of the workplace if it, you know, is feasible for you. Um, but a lot, if you allow them to come into the workplace, they have to do, you have to require the masking and you have to require the testing and you should be social distancing and sanitizing and those things. But if there are other accommodations that keep them away from other employees, then you can do that, but you can't waive the testing or the masking if they're on site. Even if they come on site on occasion as opposed to, you know, generally they work from home. If, if they're going to have to pop in and pop out from time to time, they're going to have to have a test. Um, and I, I forget the exact rule how soon before they come back that they have to provide another test. Um, it's but, but there will be testing. It's within the seven days. Anytime a remote worker comes on site, they have to have a test that was done within the last seven days. So as long as they're at home, they could be at home for two months and not test. But if they're coming into your work site, within seven days of that day they come into the work site, they have to have a test each time. Okay, next question. What do you recommend employers under the CMS mandate do for staff who don't, do not have a vaccine by the December 5th or 6th, but decide to get the first shot prior to January 4th? Can these staff work or not? I would send them out to get the J and J. I mean, that's the only way they're gonna be fully vaccinated such that the government would consider you to be in full compliance by January 4th. Okay, and what can employers ask at the pre-hire stage if the employer is under the CMS mandate? Does the employer need to process an exemption accommodation request prior to ha uh, uh, having a new staff enter the facility, or can they work under enhanced infection control measures until vaccinated or exempted? No, I think they're going to have to. You're going to have to treat them like your other employees. So right on your website where they apply online or on your uh, uh, cover for your application, you should make it known that they have to be vaccinated. And so when they come on board, they're going to have to be fully vaccinated before they start if it's, if it's after January 4th. Or else you're going to have to understand what their request is for an exemption and decide whether or not it's granted. If it's granted, then they got to start complying with the testing requirements. If it's denied, then they have to get vaccinated or you, you can't bring them on, you can't onboard them. They can't come work for you. Two last questions here. Uh, does an employer have to pay for testing for an employee with a medical exemption as, re as a reasonable accommodation? Well, we just discussed that there's no rule that the employer has to pay for the testing period unless you fall underneath the um, the emergency temporary rule for the the um, first responders, the medical personnel. Yeah, Claudia, I can see I see where this question is going, and I guess there's a possibility, but. I guess if an employee pushed it, possibly, but I don't think as a general rule, um, the employer would have to. I, I feel like it would fall kind of under the, you know, you don't have to buy personal um, hearing aids or aids like that as an accommodation. Um, I think it'd be a threat to require it as an ADA accommodation, but I because the, 
yeah, because the rule specifically says that the employer does not have to pay for the testing if you have employees who have to get, yeah, okay, I'm talking around the circle, sorry. The rule says the employer doesn't have to pay for testing if you have employees who have to get tested, and the only employees who have to get tested either have an ADA or a religious exemption, so no, you would not have to. Last question, is there a mask requirement effective December 4th for unvaccinated employees? Yes. Yeah, well, that's in place right now under Michigan's rule. Well, that's all I have for you. I know, I, like I said, some folks probably joined a little late and whatnot, so maybe you were catching up. So great questions, everybody. We appreciate all of those. Um, so what we're going to do is move forward now and uh, kind of wrap things up. Um, just want to remind everybody that once we're done here today, we're going to be sending you out a quick survey. We'd love to have your feedback. Uh, we have in particular love to get suggested topics for the future. And we were talking before we started about how, how everybody is zoomed out. Um, but, you know, I come from the school of we give you a great topic or great content, as we call it. Um, you, you, you will hopefully join us. And so we rely on you to give us that, that direction. Uh, the other thing I wanted to share is that we did uh, mention at the front, front end of the program that we have this event recorded. Uh, we'll have that wrapped up a little later this afternoon. It'll be available for you and any colleagues that maybe couldn't make it so direct into our event page on our website, and the, the links will be right there for them. And one quick plug for our sophisticated employer blog. Uh, we have a ton of good information out there. Hopefully, you're following it. You can subscribe by email if you'd like to, and uh, notifications will be sent to you when new content posts. So we'd love for you to join us on the Sophisticated Employer blog for all of your employment law updates. And with that, um, allow me on behalf of Claudia and Laura to wish everyone a happy and healthy Thanksgiving, and um, be careful out there, be safe, and we'll see you next time.